Let's bring in Lee Jenkins, SI senior writer, was at the game in L.A. last night. Lee, set the scene for me a little bit. What was the press conference that Jason Collins held like, and what was the buzz in the arena for Jason Collins like? Yeah, it was a packed room with the press conference, Chris, but as far as the buzz in the arena, it wasn't really what I expected. And, and it, it, you know, it makes you wonder um, if this story is more of a media story and, and a story for the NBA than it is necessarily for the common fans, because he was playing last night in his hometown. He was in L.A. It was a packed house. It was a pretty riled up crowd um, for a Sunday night Laker team, it's the worst in the Western Conference. And when he checked in the game, I mean, there was warm applause, um, but it wasn't anything like I think the big reaction that a lot of us were expecting. I mean, it felt in some ways kind of anticlimactic. There just there just wasn't that outpouring of support, um, and then also it also didn't go the other way either. It was just there just seemed to be an ambivalence toward him. How much awareness was there inside the arena? of Jason Collins actually having a possibility of playing? Because remember, he only signed hours before then. I wasn't convinced that he was going to even get in the game. Was there a level of awareness there that he might actually play? And I think that's a big I think that's a big key to this. I think a lot of people, um, a lot of late, people were there were there for the Lakers. They, they didn't even, just didn't register. I mean, it definitely felt like people were kind of looking at each other in the arena, like, is that the Jason Collins? And you're right, it just came together so fast. I mean, when most of us woke up Sunday morning, we had no idea that he could be playing Sunday night. You know, we had no idea that he'd be in uniform, much less actually get on the floor. Or as, a, as a guy in a 10-day contract. You wrote a good story on SI.com about the, the atmosphere last night and about why the Nets decided to, uh, to sign Jason Collins. A good backstory at the top of that story uh, on SI.com. Give us a synopsis of what the Nets' thinking was in signing Jason. Right, Chris, that they did it because they needed to fortify their front court. You know, they needed size with Reggie Evans gone to Sacramento. Uh, but I, you and I know no, nothing in the NBA gets accomplished without the okay and the approval of the stars. And the Nets have a lot of stars in their locker room. And by chance, a lot of them have played with Jason Collins. I mean, a lot of them have run around his screens. He's kind of freed them up and put them in ideal situations throughout their individual careers. And I think in some ways, this was a chance to return a favor and to do right by a, a teammate, by an old friend. Um, and I think that the, the word that came to Jason Kidd and came to the Nets front office from those stars is that they weren't just ready to do this, that they wanted to do it. There was an eagerness um, to embrace this guy and to kind of own a little bit of history. Were there any concerns inside the locker room, inside the coaching office, inside the front office about bringing him in either for you know inside the locker room reasons or the media distraction reasons? Yeah. Distraction. That's what you always hear, and I think in this case, that is purely about the media. It's just about having more reporters in there asking questions. And look, if you have that many reporters in asking that many questions, you know, there's always the chance that somebody's going to slip and say something insensitive and it's going to get blown up. So I think that's probably the number one drawback when they were gauging whether to sign Jason. I think that was it's there for a lot of teams, and the Nets deserve credit I think, for being the one franchise that was able to take that on and able to absorb you know, the th- that, that very minor threat in the grand scheme of things. Who were some of Jason's biggest advocates within that Nets organization? I mean, it's the ones who matter most. It was Pierce and Garnett and Darren Williams. It was Joe Johnson who played with him in Atlanta. It's just incredible how many of all those guys have played with him throughout his career. But not only them. Well, Darren Williams hasn't, but he played with his brother. Karolinko played with his brother. Brooke Lopez obviously was at Stanford, uh, has known Collins and worked out with him. So I just think all of that support, and then you couple it with the institutional knowledge of the Nets. I know they've moved, but the soul of that organization hasn't changed all that much. You know, they, you know, I was hearing a story last night about when Collins was traded in 08 to Memphis. He knew the trade had gone down. It just hadn't been officially announced yet. And he still played that night, the night he was traded, because he knew the team was shorthanded. And they actually started him, ran a play for him out of the gate. So there are just enough positive feelings about Jason Collins within, within the Nets that I think this became easy. And isn't that what they always say, that familiarity kind of diminishes any prejudice that might be out there? They know Jason Collins. If anything, they're biased toward him. Soul of the organization. you kind of riding on the air, aren't you, Lee? I like it. I can't keep up with you, man. <laughs> uh, inside, talking to Lee Jenkins, by the way, senior writer, SI, SISI.com, who was at the game last night in Los Angeles for Jason Collins' debut uh, with the Brooklyn Nets. Were there any negative reactions you heard, either from the crowd or from Laker players? 
No, and I don't think – I mean, I, I didn't. I also didn't spend a lot of time in the Laker locker room. I think it's going to be hard for anybody to hear a, a, any of that because I think in this day and age, players know, especially ones who are in the NBA, uh, know that any comment that's seen as anything other than supportive is just going to get completely blown up, and that player is going to become potentially a national pariah. So I, I wouldn't expect to hear any of that. Um, but look, with the time and the media scrutiny on him, it, it's possible. It, it's it's going to be interesting, Chris, to see whether this coverage sustains itself. Like Collins was talking about last night, in this day and age, the, the news cycle changes so quickly. He thinks people will move on from his story uh, rather soon, that it'll go back with him to Brooklyn when the team goes home, and then it'll kind of wane from there. And I'm curious to see if he's correct. Good to talk to you, Lee. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Take care, man.